1935, the year of Elvis Presley's birth, Monopoly first appears and Adolf Hitler starts the road to war with conscription. Did this enter the consciousness of the protagonists of this story? Doubtful as they seem to be a British version of the Grapes of Wrath. Over to you, James, to fill us in on this tale of woe. This episode covers events in Hannam Woods, or Hannam Abbots as it was known in 1935 an area that lies alongside the wandering River Avon, to the east of Bristol and on the southern fringes of the county of Gloucestershire in England's west country. The area in question is best described as a settlement of ramshackle shacks with allotments and subsistence living. It was considered to be the wrong side of the tracks to the more genteel folk in the elegant terraces in the thriving city a few miles away. It is perhaps staggering to note that there were 5,018 murders in Britain that year, which brings our focus to this area of the country for one of those. Among the scattered community lived Henry Knott and his wife Bessie, with their eight-year-old son Dennis. The couple had known each other since they were teenagers and had married in 1926, but Bessie had formed a friendship with one of their neighbours a few hundred metres away, by the name of Arthur Franklin. He shared a shack with his brother Frank, and both of them had come over from Ireland looking for a better life. Over time, the relationship between Frank and Bessie had slowly deepened, and growing weary of her husband, Bessie decided the best course of action open to her was, having formed this new attachment, to move in with Arthur and his brother. Henry Knott was a casual farm worker, and he was not the most hard-working person. At times during the marriage, the family had nearly faced starvation. They had a small chicken farm, which was mainly looked after by the more industrious Bessie, but this only provided a meagre income. There was hardly enough to keep the family afloat. When his wife moved out, Knott was less concerned with the loss of his family, but more about the work that he was now having to do. He even asked if his wife could return during the day to do the work. Their son Dennis continued to live with his father, but was a regular visitor to his mother a short way away through the woods. The new living arrangements that Bessie was engaged in proved not to be as ideal as she had hoped for, and in November 1933 she decided to leave Arthur and move back in with her estranged husband. This, sadly for her, never took place. She was in the process of moving her belongings back through the woods after a heated argument with Frank, when from seemingly nowhere a shot rang out and she fell to the ground fatally wounded in the back. Terribly, the source of this shot came from the gun of Arthur Franklin. If this wasn't bad enough, he casually walked up to his victim on the ground and callously shot her again at short range with his shotgun, in the head, as she lay fatally wounded. Witness accounts from the time state that Henry Knott now appeared on the scene, having heard the commotion, where he'd been working in a nearby field. Perhaps fortuitously, for the parties concerned, Franklin aimed his gun at Knott, but the loaded cartridge misfired, although the shot hit Henry, and he was wounded in the face. Fearing for his life, and with blood pouring profusely from his wound, he crawled through the woods and into a nearby field, intending to get to a road and summon help. Fortunately for him, he was spotted by a passer-by, who called an ambulance from a nearby phone box. He was taken to the nearby Cosham Hospital, where he luckily survived, which is more than can be said for his wife, who died where she had fallen. It was found that he had numerous shotgun pellets in his head. He did recover, but lost one of his eyes. Some locals were soon at the scene and managed to usher Frank back into his home. The police were understandably promptly summoned and arrested him, whereby he was taken into custody to Staple Hill Police Station and charged with the felonious murder of Bessie Knott and the attempted murder of her husband. 
he perhaps flippantly quipped that had his gun not misfired and not having another cartridge to hand, he would have been charged with two murders. A post-mortem carried out by the pathologist on Bessie Knott at Bristol General Hospital revealed the extent of her injuries. She'd been shot twice, once in the back and once in the head, which literally had blown her brains out. When Arthur Franklin appeared before the magistrates, he was told that he could get legal aid for his defence. He had pleaded guilty to all the charges and flatly refused any offers of help, telling the court that he did not want to go to the trouble and he did not want any legal aid. He was remanded to appear at Gloucester Assizes on the 5th of June 1935. At the trial, it was revealed that on the day of the murder, Bessie Knott had been walking through the woods towards her family home when she was shot from behind by Franklin and the second time she lay on the ground. The apparent motive for this attack was simply that she was returning to live with her husband. Franklin had become jealous and could not face Bessie forsaking him for her husband, whom she had previously left, particularly as he had little regard for Henry Knott. Having heard the shots in the woods, Knott had run to the place where his wife lay dead and watched in horror as Franklin aimed a single barrel shotgun directly at him and fire. With no defence offered at court and with the confession of the accused, the judge had no option but to pass the death penalty, the place of execution being Gloucester Jail. It had only taken six minutes from the time that Arthur Franklin then aged 45, to be convicted. He had shown the same stoical demeanour throughout and seemed quite unfazed by his impending fate. A mere 20 days after being sentenced, justice was served on the 26th of June 1935 by the renowned executioner Thomas Pierpoint at 8am in the morning. So ends this sorry tale. But what are the other characters involved in this story? A few months after the execution, Frank Franklin, Arthur's brother, went to the police and asked for the return of his brother's shotgun. Since he had not been involved in the crime and was seen as a person of good character, the authorities had no reason to decline his request. No one could have imagined the real reason, as a few days later, Frank for whatever reason, committed suicide in the dwelling he had shared with his late brother. Dennis Knott, the son of Bessie and Henry, grew up and joined the army to do his national service, and once completed found employment with the company of agricultural contractors. He was now 21, and soon to be married, but had a fall from a ladder while stacking hay bales, and was killed instantly with a broken neck. His father, Henry Knott, continued to live in Hannon Woods until the 1960s, when the local council bought the land. He was rehoused in nearby Cadbury Heath, and in later years remarried. He outlived his second wife, and died aged 84 in 1989. So John, a lot of sorrow in the woods. Can you sum up for us these events? Years ago, a gardener once commented to the author about sexual mores and islands. He contended that the smaller the island, the worse the incidence of casual sex. Basically, everyone knows everyone else's business and the gene pool is limited. But this occurred in a part of Bristol. Are the people in this story true Bristolians who say work at Will's cigarette factory and support either Bristol City or Bristol Rovers football clubs or even Bristol Rugby. Alternatively, they could be classified as a community of isolated peasants, scratching a living from the land. Therefore, all emotions become heightened. In a metropolis like London, you can leave your partner and move down the road and never see them again. This is remarkable, as you probably take the same bus or underground to work and return at the same time. <laughs> 